During the lockdown in 2020, I tried to make a series of videos to teach people how to make a violin, but then the environment around my workplace became very challenging for me to continue with that. So I had to change my approach to do it, and this video is part of the result of the new approach. And today, I'm going to briefly walk you through how to make a violin along with these footages. I use Bruce here for the blocks because it is kind of universal. You can also use Willow. I just happen to have a lot of spruce after making a number of violins. We use high glue in violin making and 60 degree, which is 140 Fahrenheit, is the best temperature for cooking the glue. Generally, high glue take 1 hour to dry and 24 hours to be totally set. So it would be best to leave it untouched for 24 hours. After the glue is set, then we can first work on the sea belts. For educational purpose and the sake of accuracy, this is the first time I make a form with a CNC machine and make templates with laser cuts instead of doing it by hand. And I want to specially say thank you here to my friend Sing Chi Lao for helping to make this possible. Here I'm using a file to make the curve smooth and check if it is square. The thing I'm using here is called a graduation chopper. The space between the needle and the screw is 1mm and everything that is thicker than that will get scratched. Simply plane off the scratch marks and you will have everything in 1mm without using too much of your brain juice. Then scrape a little to make the surface smooth and shiny. Then we're going to use the bending iron to bend the ribs. Take your time because you don't want to break it. Once it is in a good shape, glue them onto the blocks. We find the ribs a little. Then we are going to work on the upper bows and the lower bows. This is just like making the sea bows, and actually, it is kind of challenging to film because it is already demanding to cut them into an ideal shape. And on top of that, I have to be very mindful that nothing is blocking the camera, such as my hands, the tool, or any shadow. And also, I have to make sure there is no noise from the outside world, all at the same time. And also, there is no second chance. A friendly reminder, this is the most dangerous tool in the whole filing making process. Yes, it is a regular cutter. Refine the edge a little, then let's work on the inside of the ribs. If you don't know it yet, there are linings in a violin and I'm opening the lining channel here for the linings to sit in. This is a lining, I use spruce for that, the material is just like what I use for the blocks, but working on it is like working on the ribs. You will have to plane it, bend it, and glue it. Well, these are just laundry claims. And that's how we finish making the ribs, for now. The wood we use for the ribs and the back is called maple. The pattern you can see there is called flame or figure. That's why some people call it flame maple. This may be contrary to what you have heard before, but if the edges are both square enough, you don't have to clamp them. 
after the glue is set, playing the surface flat, then we can work on the outline of the back. This line should be 3 mm from the ribs, and I use a template to make sure it is. I use this Demon Slayer coin here to get a good curve. Anything with a diameter around 30 mm will do. And remember to leave some room for the button on the back here, because once you cut it out, it is hard to put it back. Many of you, including my Sifu Michael Darnton, ask me about this thing I'm using here. It is actually just a bow saw. It is a very primitive version of what we are using nowadays. The handle is made with a quarter saw bamboo, and the saw blade is held by a piece of crooked nail at both ends. I use the big wraps to make the rough outline, and a smaller one for the corners. Don't be scared by them, they are just like files, but with higher attack points. After we have a rough outline, use a marking gauge to mark the thickness of the edges, then work on it. We will do a rough arching and trim the edges down as closely to the line we just make as possible. And in case you think this is very nice to stare at, I've made some ASMR videos with all this rough digging scenario, including the back and the top. You can just click there to check it out. Make sure to slow down when you are close to the line. And now since the edges are thinner, it will be easier for us to work on the outline in details. So refine it as much as you can, then it's time for the purfling. Here I'm opening a purfling channel for putting the purfling in. It's kind of similar to the lining channel, just way longer. And be careful not to knock down anything besides the channel itself here, especially the inside of the corners. Now let's work on the purfling. There are many kinds of wood you can use for the purflings, including maple. You can make your own or just buy some semi-finished purflings and work on it. Bend them a little and put them into the purfling channel to see how it looks. If you like it, then you can add glue to glue them up. And you will need a small mirror near to help you with this. After that, mark a line between the edge and the purflings. Then dig a scoop along the outline, just like making a mullet. After we have the moat, let's work on the castle. I will first make sure the height in the middle is right, then I'll develop the arching from there with finger planks. I like using the finger planks very much. Using them is like really communicating with the wood. They will help you to understand how wood grains work and learn how to work with what I call the flow in the wood. And this is one of the most joyful part in the whole making process for me.
This thing is called a circonic compass. We use it to draw contour lines to check if we are making a good arching. If yes, you will be very happy. If no, it will be easy to see. Just fix it, then you can still be happy. Then we're going to scrape the surface and make it smooth. That's how people do it back then when there is no sandpaper. After that, we're going to work on the plate thickness. I also make an ASMR video on this, feel free to check it out too. After some rough digging, use finger planes for the detail works. And remember to check the thickness from time to time. Then refine the edges and the corners. And that's how we finish making the back. We use bruise for the top. The procedure for making the top is very similar to the back. You can say it's easier because the wood is softer, so it's easier to cut. But you can also say it's harder, also because the wood is softer. It would be easier for you to knock things down, especially when making the purflings. Yes, there is also an ASMR video for this. We will stop before finalizing the thickness and turn back to work on the apples. The F holes is one of the places you can see how simplicity works on a violin, but more on that later. I must confess I did use electric hand drill here for the sake of accuracy, also because traditional hand drills are really hard to find and very very hard to use. Cutting the F hole with a knife here will also force you to learn to go with the flow in the wood, or you'll just break it. And remember to add the wing tips onto the F holes so it is actually an F, not an, you know, S. Then lastly, we're going to make the wing and the scoop here into a good shape. Then turn it back and finalize the thickness.
And this is what you will see if you put a light behind your thin enough plate. Fascinating, isn't it? Besides the linings, there is a bar on the back of the base part of the top that we call a base bar. And we also use sprues for that. All we have to do is to make the bar fit with the inside of the top. What I'm doing here is called chalk fitting. You know, using the chalk as an indicator to see if it fits. Then just glue it up. After the glue is set, refine the shape of the bar. And I think this little block is kind of cute, but I have to cut it away. Then keep refining the base bar. After that, refine the edges and the corners, just like what we did with the back. And that's how we finish making the top. And now you should probably recognize it already. Yes, it is maple. We also use it for the scroll. And here comes the ball saw again. It is a bit harder this time because the piece is thicker. I have to make sure I'm cutting straight all the way down all the time and not cutting into the scroll. And that's how the scroll escaped from the wood. Here I am trying my best to make all the edges as 90 degrees as possible and it's kind of therapeutic. I will sometimes add water onto the scroll to make it easier to trim. Now check if it is square. And the outcome should be something like this. Then draw out the center line. And draft the shape of the scroll with a pencil and a drawing compass. The plastic thing I'm using here is just a cutout from a file. A plastic file, not the tool file. I'm using a drill press here instead of a hand drill because accuracy is very very important here. And again remember not to cut into the scroll. And this really makes me think of sashimi, you know. Then just cut everything to line. This is actually not as hard as it seems. Just slow down and do the right thing at the right time. It is better to go slow than going fast and make irreversible mistakes. Then you eventually get there.
Now let's work on the top level of the Tower of the Babel. And then the flooding of the sign of the scroll. Then refine the bevel. And now let's work on the other sign of the scroll. After that, we are going to work on the pack box. A hand drill can help remove the wood in the middle faster, but be careful not to drill through the scroll. We will have to glue the fingerboard and the nut on before finishing the pack box, so let's work on it now. And now we can finish the pack box. And now let's work on the flooding on the back. and refine anything that needed to be refined. And that's how we finish making the scroll. This step is kind of violent. Be careful you don't break the ribs. Then refine the inside of the ribs, even though not many people will be able to see it. And that's the spirit of a carbon. Now let's glue the ribs and the top together. And while waiting for the glue to set, I will make the label. You can make any kind of label you like, just don't make it too big. And glue it on before closing of the box. Here I am cleaning up the surface and make it as smooth as I possibly can before varnishing because all the tool marks will suddenly become very obvious once you put the varnish on. Wipe the top with a wet towel, then you will see some spikes standing up. Let it dry a bit and clean them up with a horse tail or just with a scraper. Now let it enjoy the sunshine as long as possible, then we can put the varnish on. Here I am adding alcohol-based color dye onto the violin. Make sure the whole body gets it. 
and it is better to apply a few thin coats than one thick coat. The color will look smoother that way. And now let's add shellac as the ground coat. The reason why I varnish the body now before joining the scroll is because I don't want to knock off the fingerboard later for varnishing and also it can protect the body when I'm joining the scroll. Now let's refine the neck. And open the space on the body for the neck to fit in. This is the most intense part of the whole making process because the angle of the neck is very important. And it's so intense that I almost forgot to take this shot. Now let's glue them up and wait for another 24 hours. After that, we can finalize the neck. I will first establish the thickness near both ends as a waypoint. I exaggerate a little here so you can see clearly where to cut. Then join everything in between together. and use files to make it as smooth as possible. Then refine everything. Sand it with sandpapers. And check if it is smooth and balanced. You will actually know better here if you know how to play the violin. And if you're satisfied with the neck, let's finish making the button. Then also varnish the neck. and the scroll. And now I'm adding oil varnish onto the violin. If you look closely enough, you will find the texture is different from the varnish I used before this. And just let it dry for a long, long time. Here I'm applying linseed oil onto the neck. The work on the nuts. and open the space for the cello. Prepare the cello and glue it on. Then refine the shape of it and be very careful not to scratch the varnish. 
And that is the reason why I put some masking tape on there. Here I'm opening the hole for the end button and also for the packs. Then prepare the packs. Lube it and make them fit with the holes. Then prepare the sound poles. and put it into the violin. And then the bridge, I will first playing the bottom area thinner and make it fit with the arching of the violin. <laughs> Look at this tiny pencil. Then work on the top. Refine the curve. And put the name on. And lastly, the tailpiece and the chin rest. And that's how we finish making the violin. Oh, and one last thing, always remember to put a cloth here, or you will turn out be like me, scratch your violin, wanted to fix it, and set out to go make one. So I'll see you around next time, it is gonna be a detailed tutorial on how to make this very same violin at home, in which I will cover all the tools, woods, and accessories that you need to buy. We will also take a deep dive into the templates and form, and I'll take you to my workshop and try my best to explain all the steps and techniques that I use as well as some tips and tricks for a first time build. The tutorial is aimed at absolute beginners, so don't worry if you don't know anything about woodworking or think yourself as an executioner of artwork. I was at the same place not very long ago. Alright amigos, I will see you next time, comment below if you have any questions, remember to like and subscribe, and get ready to see my puck dropping the scroll again.